That song, The Goodness of God, that, that line that uh, gets me every time is, your goodness is running after me. It, it, maybe, you, maybe you connected it, maybe you didn't, but um, it's from Psalm 23, or at least it's based on that, where David writes, prays, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And it's, a, it's a pretty powerful thing to think that God's mercy is chasing you down. It's coming after you. And, uh, and then remember that sometimes we run away from it. And it's good to gather and sing that and be reminded that he's, his mercy is running after us. His goodness is running after us. Let's pray before we open God's word together. Father, you are our good shepherd and we are sheep of your hand. And like sheep, we, we stray, we wander, uh, we are tiresome and foolish. But you care for us, provide for us, tend to us, and chase after us when we wander. Thank you for bringing us here together as your little flock, and we pray that you would speak to us as our good shepherd from your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, you don't have to show hands or anything, but uh, I'll just ask the question. I assume I know the answer, but have you ever been amazed by God? Hopefully the answer is yes. Hopefully it's recently. Have you ever been, uh, opened his word and, and read something you've read a thousand times, but like, whoa, I never saw that before, and it, it just stunned you? Or, you know, my wife and I got away for a couple days to, uh, to Michigan, you know, pure Michigan, and just uh, sunset on the beach, which, which happens every night. Uh, and people are there, always there, but it caught me off guard. It's so beautiful, the colors, you just could not recreate that. Or, or maybe just the quietness of your, uh, in the morning with a good cup of coffee, and uh, just the quietness and the, and the awareness of his presence. Maybe a song, like a favorite song we just sang, comes on. Like, when's the last time you were amazed by God? Amazed by his love, amazed by the beauty of creation, amazed in his word? Hopefully it's recently, hopefully it's every day. Maybe if I flip the, the, the question around. Do you think God's ever been amazed by you? I don't mean like amazed at how ridiculous you are, amazed at how foolish and rebellious you are. I mean, do you think ever God's been amazed at you? Most of us would say, no, he's God, he knows everything. Do you think Jesus could ever be amazed by the quality of your faith? What kind of faith could possibly amaze God? Keep that question in mind. This is precisely what happens in this uh, encounter we're going to look at from Luke chapter 7. Uh, it's, we, well, the series is called Face to Face. However, this encounter between a Roman centurion and Jesus, they actually never meet face to face, which makes it all the more, uh, well, maybe you wonder why it's in this series, but, uh, but it makes it all the more amazing and incredible and surprising what Jesus says about this man's faith and what we can learn from it. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to read from this Christian Standard Bible. I typically read and study and preach out of the English Standard Version. Today I'm using the CSB because I just like the way that it says a few things. We don't have like an official Bible. There's lots of good translations. So anyway, if you're confused about that or pay attention to such things. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When he had concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. A centurion servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly and saying, he is worthy for you to grant this because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself since I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. With those who have been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. Okay, there's lots of questions uh, I have, maybe you have, about this, this text, this little encounter, uh, that some of them jump right out to us. First of all, a, a Roman centurion? And why would he send Jewish elders? Why would they go? 
uh, on his request. He built them a synagogue. I mean, there's a lot of questions sort of lurking in this text about what's going on here. But the biggest question is, Jesus says he was amazed at him. What kind of faith amazes Jesus? What kind of faith amazes Jesus? Let me say that again. What kind of faith amazes Jesus? That's what we're going to learn from this text. We're going to see a, a couple of things here. Uh, in Luke 7, 9, uh, we see two different translations. Uh, ESV says marveled at him, and NIV says amazed at him. The Greek word is thaumazo, which literally means to wonder greatly, to marvel at, to be utterly amazed, like stunned, like, whoa. It's, this word is used 45 times in the New Testament. Almost always it's used to refer to the crowds being amazed at things Jesus said and did. Astonished at his authority, amazed at his teaching, marveling at the things that he did, his miracles. It's almost always used to describe how we feel about God. Only a couple of times is it used here in one other place. The only other place it's used to describe Jesus being amazed at us is when he's amazed at the lack of faith in his hometown, Nazareth. So this is the only place in all the Bible we're told that Jesus is amazed in a positive sense about anyone's faith. And it's this guy, a Roman centurion. Just pause for a minute. If you're one of the disciples, how do you think that feels to you? We left everything to follow you. We gave up our lives to follow you. And you're praising this Roman centurion? Like they're the problem in the world today. And this is the guy? It's said about, not said about a rabbi. It's not said about a teacher of the law. Not said about a priest. Not even said about a Jew. It's said about a Roman soldier, a centurion. Now, on one hand, this is kind of shocking, would be to the disciples. But on the other hand, I think this, this fits with what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels. He, Jesus is frequently drawing out very unlikely sources to teach us lessons of faith. He's always choosing people that are outside what you might expect, the, the acceptable people, the center of who's in and who's out in the Jewish worldview of the day. In Luke chapter 10, it's the good Samaritan. We don't even think about that phrase much because it's on hospitals and so on, the good Samaritan. But that, though, that's an oxymoron to the Jewish worldview. Good Samaritan, that's like saying good ISIS member. It doesn't go together in their mind. The sinful woman later in this chapter he praises her. She loves much because she knows she's been forgiven much. The persistent widow, a tax collector. These are the examples he uses, and so maybe it shouldn't surprise us. But he says something about this centurion he doesn't say about anyone else in the New Testament. Not even in Israel has he found such faith. Now, you'll see an image here of it when I talk about a centurion of, of Gaius. This is a character from, anybody watch The Chosen? The the series The Chosen, this is Gaius the Centurion. You get to know him. He's a um, Roman official. Centurion, by the way, was a commander of 100 or more, at least 100 soldiers under his command. Kind of a mid-level rank, uh, mid, mid to upper level rank uh, in the Roman military. But in this part of the world, they were a very important men because you didn't have a lot of the top officials in the Roman military in Judea. So a centurion was a high rank in that region. And they were a pe person of influence, 100 soldiers at their beck and call. And they were a person of considerable wealth in that part of the world. They usually had uh, an estate, servants, and so on. So it's an important man. Uh, they're often, centurions are notorious for their brutality. You might remember the story of the centurion presiding over Jesus' death. A centurion with his soldiers would be responsible for carrying out all the execution from the beatings to the carrying of the cross to keeping the crowds back all the way to Golgotha and the execution. That was certainly true with Jesus and we know the centurion who witnessed that and saw how Jesus died said, surely this man was the son of God. But they could be brutal, um, excessive use of force, but this guy's different as we're gonna see. In verse two, we, he, he cares about his servant. His servant is sick, his servant is near death. He can't do anything despite all of his resources, all the, uh, the best medical attention he could afford, but it's not helping. And he cares deeply for this servant, which is really a slave in his household. He doesn't view him as property. He cares about his well-being. He loves the Jewish people. The elders say he cares for our nation. He loves our nation. And he's generous. 
He built a synagogue for them. And he's not Jewish. So here, a Gentile Roman, but he's a pretty good guy. This is not what amazes Jesus. Jesus is not amazed that he's generous. He's not amazed that he's nice or that he cares for his servant or that he's good to the Jews. That's not what amazes him. He's held up a model for faith, not because he's kind and generous. Most of us would like to think it works that way. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good person. I'm not perfect. I know that I'm not perfect. The Bible says so. But look around. I mean, there's a lot of wackos in the world and a lot of people doing terrible things, and I'm pretty good. That's not what amazes Jesus. That's not what impresses him. Let's set a little context here. Jesus has been out on the countryside healing people uh, of their diseases, cleansing people of sicknesses and illnesses and restoring them, and most importantly, teaching about the kingdom of God. And news about him is spreading. And he comes into a town called Capernaum. You'll see in the miniature of the map. So if you're wondering, like, the first two-thirds of Jesus' uh, public life that we read about in the Gospels takes place in this region, the region of Galilee. And you'll see here... Uh, Jesus' hometown is Nazareth. He wasn't born here. He was born in Bethlehem because his parents had to travel away for the census. But he was, his hometown, where they're from, is Nazareth. And it's, it's the sticks. It's like, it's middle of nowhere. It's like, uh, I don't know, Big Rock or Hinkley. Yeah, oh, sorry if you're from there. Uh, but it's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Remember that his first miracle happens right here. It, the wedding at Cana turns water into wine there. Uh, Capernaum is Peter's hometown. And this becomes Jesus' sort of home base or base of operations after he gets rejected at Nazareth. His own hometown says, isn't this Joseph's boy? Who does he think he is? And they don't accept him. In fact, they try to throw him off a cliff. And he leaves. So, you know, maybe you don't go back home then after that happens. And Capernaum becomes his sort of home base of operations. So he's been out in this region preaching, healing, teaching. People are amazed. They're coming to understand the Messiah has come. He's changing lives and word is spreading and he's coming back for a little break to Capernaum. Maybe, maybe staying at Peter's house. My wife and I have been there. They've under, there's a synagogue built over the top of what they believe was Peter's home uh, in Capernaum, right on the Sea of Galilee. As of course you know, Peter was a fisherman. He enters the town. He's met by a delegation of Jewish elders as he enters. Let's look at verses 4 through 5 once more of the text. Luke 7, verses 4 through 5. If we can get there. Luke 7, 4 through 5. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this, because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Jesus, we'll go back to that four and five, stay there for a second. He is worthy. Did you see that? What's the basis of their appeal to Jesus for this guy? He's a good man. He's worthy. He matters. He, he's earned it. He deserves it. I mean, on the whole, Jesus, this guy is way, way better than most Romans. He cares about us. And again, I think that most of us, though we wouldn't say it out loud, want to believe we can approach Jesus on the base of our merit. I'm not perfect, but I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing a good job. You ever see the movie, What About Bob? Right? I'm not a slacker. I'm doing the work. <laughs> like I'm trying. Now, look at verses 6 through 8. Jesus went with them. So he goes with them, but he knows the whole, what's going on here. When he's not far from the house, the centurion sent friends. D pause for a minute. He already sent Jewish elders to Jesus. And they appeal to Jesus. Jesus agrees to come to the house, and he's going with them. And then he sends another group of friends who catch them part way. I don't know what's going on in the centurion's mind, but basically he sends his friends to say, you don't even have to come. You don't even have to come all the way. In fact, it's probably, I'm not worthy that you should come. Two times he says, I am not worthy. I dropped my magic pen. There we are. Two times he says that he is not worthy. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. I don't consider myself worthy to come to you. This is a shocking thing for a Roman centurion to say. I'm not worthy to have a Jew come under my roof? This is a Roman centurion, an important man with the might of Rome's military behind him who's wealthy, and he's saying, this guy, I, I, I'm not even worthy to have you come into my house. In fact, I, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence, he's saying. This is, 
and this is not false humility. This is not like some people will come and say, they sort of, have you ever talked to somebody and they're kind of buttering you up and you know that they're going to make a request and it's like, oh, I know that I know that you're, I'm, not, I'm nothing important, you're very busy, but they're building up to a big request. That's not what's going on here. The, there's two simple truths about this man or for the reason why he's held up as a model for our faith. The centurion's a model for true faith because he understands two things. He's not worthy to come to Jesus, and Jesus has all power and authority. You gotta write those things down, take a picture, remember those. It's not because he's a good man, it's not because he cares about the Jews, not because he's generous, not because you go to church, not because you do and you serve. It's because he understands deep in his heart two things. I have a need I can't meet, and I'm not worthy to come to him. But he has all power and authority. These two, two simple truths make up the, the shape of the centurion's faith. I don't deserve it, but Jesus can do it. He doesn't owe it to me, but I know that he can. He understood and believed something about Jesus, actually, that even the disciples struggled at this stage of their journey to get. Even those closest to Jesus were struggling to grasp this. Most people did not have the, the resources yet, spiritually or intellectually, to get it. But he does. And the reason Jesus is amazed, it's almost like Jesus goes, finally, he gets it. Somebody gets it. Hey, you 12, look at that guy. Let me just pause for a minute. I, I don't know if I have faith that would amaze Jesus. I want to, and I want to learn from this man. And I guess maybe one question we could ask is, are we willing to learn lessons of faith from unlikely sources? Are we willing to learn about how to follow and trust Jesus from people that maybe are outside, you know, what we're, what we're used to? That's, that would be hard for the disciples. In, in Matthew's account of this very same story, Matthew says, this guy's kind of a precursor to the many who will come, including us. Matthew 8, verse 11 puts it this way. I tell you that many will come from east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This is a reference to what Jews thought awaited them. This is our place, our banquet. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but... He gets something that you don't get yet. You will, but you're not there yet. And in fact, many will come. We will, us, those who trust in Christ. And the centurion is the first, in a way, of many to come. I want to look at the two things, that, that last part. He, get, he got his, he's not worthy, and he gets Jesus' power and authority. Look at verse 6 with me for a minute. It says, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. The contrast between how the elders approach Jesus and how the centurion approaches him when he sends his friends. He's worthy for you to do this. I'm not worthy. The humility in seeing ourselves accurately in light of Jesus Christ is evident in this little scene. When you think about humility, do you, do you think about your own humility much? Do you ever focus on it? Do you ever become very proud of how humble you are? <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been very humble lately. I've been growing in my humility. Like, as soon as you talk about it, it doesn't really work, does it? Humility is not something you, you get by focusing on trying hard to be humble. It's a byproduct of being in the presence of Christ, of seeking him, of knowing how much he loves you, of recognizing how much he's done for you, and seeing your own sin and his mercy. C.S. Lewis writes about humility. I think some of us think about humility in a wrong way, as if it's self-deprecating comments or humor or putting yourself down. That's not biblical humility. Here's what Lewis writes about this. Uh, this is out of his famous Mere Christianity. Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man... Oh, let me pause. How many of you heard this quote falsely attributed to C.S. Lewis? Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody ever heard it attributed to Lewis? Wrong. I feel like I should have a second job as the internet police about false C.S. Lewis quotes. <laughs> what he says is, is a, that's, a, that's a bad paraphrase. What he says is actually better. 
Here it is. Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who's always telling you that of course he's a nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud and a biggish step too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. This has really been helpful to me. A humble person is not thinking about themselves. They're genuinely interested in other people because they're filled with the love of Christ. It could not have been an easy thing for this wealthy, powerful Roman centurion to send for help to a homeless Jewish rabbi. But he does. It's a biggish step to recognize your need for Jesus, to see your pride and acknowledge your weakness. Let me put it to you as simply as I can. There are only two ways you can approach Jesus. You can approach him on the basis of your merit or on the basis of his mercy. That's it. There's only two ways to come to him, and only one of them he accepts. You can come with your record, with your merit, with you being a pretty good person. And I, there are a lot of pretty good people here this morning. But what amazes Jesus is that this man, for all of his goodness, recognizes he is not worthy. We come to him with no credentials, no resume, nothing to warrant that he should do anything for us at all. Jesus does not owe you anything. I said that years ago in a sermon, God doesn't owe you anything, and a woman came down front so angry. What? But, I mean, there's got to be something. What am I doing in this Christian faith if he does, God doesn't owe me something? There's this transactional thought that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm trying hard. So there's got to be something, you know, coming back my way for the effort, Right? No, no, none of us are worthy. None of us could possibly be good enough. None of us have a resume that Jesus goes, whoa, okay, well. I mean, on the whole, that's pretty good. I better give you a little. All of us fall short. You can only come to him on the basis of his mercy. Timothy Keller says the irony of the gospel is, not the, the, uh, is that the only way to be worthy of it is to admit that you are totally unworthy of it. That's the way it works. And this centurion understands that he has a need he cannot meet on his own. All of his influence, all of his power, all of his wealth cannot save his servant, and he sends for help. All of us send for help somewhere, don't we? How many of you haven't cried out a prayer in desperation? Lord, if you get me out of this. I have. Many times. In recent days, too. Lord, if you just, you know, show up. Because I don't know how to fix this. I don't know. I, I'm beyond my strength. I can't do it. You felt that way? That, that's the beginning of real faith. That's the starting point, I think, in what is happening in the life of this centurion. One of the worst things that can happen to us is that your life goes just good enough for you to believe the lie that you don't need Jesus. You're not desperate for him. And I see that in my own life, and I see that in our culture, in this suburban culture. Many of us, life is, it's not perfect, but it's just good enough that we're not really desperate for him. Or we don't realize we are. The centurion also understands that he's totally unworthy to come to Jesus, and his only appeal is the merit and grace of Jesus. Look at verse 7. Luke 7, 7. I love this phrase, and this is really the reason I chose the CSB, because it says it this way. This is why I didn't consider myself worthy to come to you. Read this statement with me. But say the word. Say it again. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus, just say the word. You don't have to come and do an examination. You don't have to give a diagnosis. You don't have to be in the room. You don't have to be in the house. You don't have to be in the same street. Just say the word. This is an amazing thing to say. No diagnosis, no prescribed treatment, just say it, and I believe it'll happen. He has total confidence 
in the power and authority of Jesus and the word of Jesus to heal his servant, to change things. This has been convicting to me. I pray with people often for relatives, friends themselves who are suffering, who need healing. And I do intellectually and theologically believe that Jesus can and does heal miraculously. But I struggle sometimes, do you? I, what I do is I, I hedge it. I have a whole lot of what ifs or what abouts in my mind. If it be your will, and you know, maybe you won't, but we know you can, and I sort of play this game in my mind. Why do I do that? What am I protecting? I think my own heart. I think my own fear that maybe I don't know. And I've been challenged by the centurion's faith. Just say the word. Yes, he might not, but I believe that he can. If you've been through rooted, we call this double-fisted faith. Remember that phrase? Our God is able to save, but even if he doesn't, right? Oh, I'm really good at the even if he doesn't part. I think God is pushing me to have a tighter grip on my God is able. Just say the word, Jesus. I believe it. This is biblical faith. Hebrews chapter one, verse three puts it this way. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That means all things are sustained and held together by the word of Jesus, including every molecule in your body. You would quite literally blow apart and cease to exist if it wasn't for the word of Jesus holding you and the whole universe together. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For just as the rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. When God speaks his word, it does not, it, it's, it's not ineffectual. It does what he says. The universe was created by, the, by his word. Let there be light. Let, the, let the, the water teem with living creatures. He says it and it happens. And somehow this pagan, Gentile, Roman centurion gets this. We know, I know there's places in the Bible like John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, where ask in my name whatever you wish will be done for you. And maybe you've prayed in the name of Jesus many times and it hasn't been done for you. And maybe you're sort of, that's, that's been difficult for you. It has been for me at times. That, by the way, praying in the name of Jesus doesn't, doesn't mean you slap the name of Jesus onto whatever you want as some way of getting your prayers answered. It means when we pray with confidence in, according to the will and the word of God, we can, be, we can trust that he's able and that he will. Second thing Centurion gets is the authority of Jesus. It's his authority. This man understands authority. Look at verse 8. For I too am a man placed under authority. Having soldiers under my command, I say to this one, go, he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And any military veterans in here? Any officers that were in the military? You, 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 get, you get this. You understand authority, being under authority, having those under your authority. So th this is amazing to me. There's a lot of stuff this centurion doesn't know, but he knows enough, even from his own life experience, to apply his life experience. If I have men under my command, and I know that if I give an order, it's carried out, what happens if the Lord of heaven and earth gives a command? What must be the implication of that? He's using his life experience to like play this out. How does it work? And of course, this too is biblical. Jesus himself says in Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. How, what, what authority? All. There's no authority that exists that doesn't belong to Jesus. In John 17, verses one and two, he gets more specific. He says, Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given to him. All authority over all people to give life to those who come to him in faith. Faith in the power and the authority of Jesus. 
I just want to pause again and ask if you, ha- if you believe that. You believe that Jesus has all power and all authority in heaven and on earth, and that at his very word, he can do anything. What in your life have you given up praying about? What have you stopped bringing before Jesus because you just wonder if it's, you know, if you're knocking on a locked door when you pray? What, maybe you wouldn't say this out loud because you're theologically too sophisticated, but, but you, you deep down inside wonder, mm, I'm setting this one aside because he just has an answer or I just don't see it or I just doubt. I've been convicted by that. This Roman centurion sends for help, knows he's not worthy, but deep inside he says, all you have to do is say it. All you have to do is say it, Jesus. I know you don't owe it to me. I know I don't deserve it, but I trust that you can. Look at verses 9 and 10 once more how the story ends. Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he, he said, I tell you, I've not found so great a faith even in Israel. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. Do you notice what, like, what is the centurion's request? Heal my servant. It's like almost an afterthought in the story. It's just, oh yeah, by the way, when they got home, everything was fine. Like he just sort of thrown in there as an aside. And the reason is the point of the story is not the miracle. It's not the healing of the servant. In fact, the miracles in Scripture are never the point. They're all, Jesus is always the point. And the point of the story is the centurion's faith. And the point of his faith is the person of Jesus Christ. That's what we're given the story for. Once more, what kind of faith amazes Jesus? Faith that understands your desperate need, that knows you're not worthy or deserving of God's mercy, but trusts in the power and the authority of Jesus to do it. If that sounds impossible to you, maybe you're going, oh, that, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> that's like super Christians. Timothy Keller puts it this way, God is not after the perfection of your faith, but the direction of your faith. Timothy Keller now is with Jesus. He no longer walks by faith, he walks by sight. He sees what we only see through a glass darkly, as in the words of the Apostle Paul. He's saying, God's not after the perfection of your faith. None of us have perfect faith. There's a whole lot of stuff the centurion did not know. Never went to a Bible study, never been to a theology class, never studied the Torah. Like he's not, there's a lot he doesn't know. For all we know, he never meets Jesus face to face. But he knows enough. By the way, we too, are called to trust him before meeting him face to face. We will one day see him face to face. But between this day and that day, we know we're not worthy, but we trust in his power and his authority. We know we have a need that we can't meet on our own. Now I know some of you have doubts and questions that hold you back. Intellectual doubts, theological questions, Doubts about when you look out at the world and you see the injustice, you just, you just, you wrestle. That's okay. God isn't afraid of your questions. It's not turned off by your doubts. Those aren't the opposite of faith. They might be the very pathway to it. And some of you have wounds and disappointments that hold you back. Wounded by the church, even. Hurt by people in leadership. Hurt by people that were supposed to care for you. Maybe were supposed to represent God to you. Jesus knows all about wounds and pain and disappointment. He knows better than we do. I'm going to finish with this quote from Elizabeth Elliot. Um, if you know her story, her husband died as a martyr in Ecuador. Um, and she wrote many books. One of them is called A Path Through Suffering. And I love this the way she describes true faith. And I think it directly relates to what we see here in the centurion's life. Faith is not an instinct, it certainly is not a feeling. Feelings don't help much when you're in the lion's den or hanging on a wooden cross. It is an act of will, a choice based on the unbreakable word of God who cannot lie and who showed us what love and obedience and sacrifice mean in the person of Jesus Christ. Does our faith rest on having prayers answered as we think they should be answered? Or does it rest on that mighty love that went down into death for us? This centurion believes before Jesus heals. He believes it. 
Does our faith rest on getting what we think we ought to get from God? What, do you think, what we think he owes us or deserves us, what we want him to do? Or does it rest solely on the mighty work of Jesus Christ on the cross? I, I think I sometimes make the assumption that everybody who comes on a Sunday morning already has this faith. I know that's probably not true. I know that for even those of us who do still wrestle with it, still struggle to grow in it. I just want to give those of you who, maybe you would describe yourself this way. I know about God. I've heard the stories. I've been coming, but I, I don't know him. I'm going to give you a chance to pray with me. The great faith that Jesus sees in the centurion is not his greatness. It's just those simple facts. I have a need I can't meet. I'm unworthy to come to him, but he is able to do anything, even to forgive my sin, and I come to him not based on my merit, but his mercy. If that describes you, just bow with me and let's pray. And you can pray these words right in your own heart. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to come to you or be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. I need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus and for Jesus as my Savior and my King. Amen. All hail King Jesus, the Savior of the world and the Savior of every soul who comes to him by faith. If a moment ago you prayed with me that prayer for the first time, come tell me or go right out back there in our prayer room. We have people that want to encourage you and pray with you and celebrate the life that you have in Christ. If you need prayer for any reason, we're always available in the prayer room after the service. Now may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always until the day of his return. Amen. And go in peace.